This is section 2.9, the derivative as a function. And you'll find in this section that we build on what we've done in section 2.7 and in 2.8. Now we are going to obtain the derivative function by first considering the derivative at a point x and then treating x as a variable. So now instead of just finding the derivative at a particular point where x was a, now we're going to let x vary and it will create a new function that is called that derivative function. So if we look at the definition, it says a derivative f prime of f is the function derived from the function f for which this same limit exists. Only now because we're thinking of it as a function, we want to be able to talk about the domain of this derivative. So the domain of the derivative will be the set of all x's for which that derivative exists. So we've got some new notations that we can add to this. The first one is this f prime of x, which we've already seen, or y prime. Another way of looking at it was Leibniz's notation, which is the derivative of y with respect to x, or the derivative of f with respect to x, or the derivative with respect to x of the function. We also have this less common notation that will show up when you get into multivariable calculus. I'll expose it to you now, but you won't need it from here on out. Just want you to know know it when you see it and it will come up in a three semesters or something. So our first example is if f of x equals the square root of x minus 2, we want to find the derivative of f and then we want to state the domain of both the original and the derivative. So we're going to start just doing this algebraically. If I want f prime of x, we know from our definition of the derivative that that's the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h, which means I will plug in x plus h into this function. And then I'm going to subtract f of x, which is just an x plugged into the function, and I will divide by h. Well, if I want to simplify this, notice that I have h equals 0 on the denominator, which is not allowed. And if I plug in an h equals 0 on the top, I get 0. So 0 over 0 is evidence of a whole. I should be able to fix it. So how we're going to fix it is we're going to multiply by a smart choice for 1 that will enable us to get a factor of h out of the top. So I will multiply an x plus an h minus a 2 plus that square root of x minus 2. And on the bottom, we'll have that same thing, because remember we can only multiply by things that equal 1 so that we change the way the expression looks, but we do not change its value. If I multiply that out now, I'll get f prime of x is the limit as h approaches 0 of an x plus an h minus a 2 minus that x minus a 2. Now don't drop your parentheses or you'll end up with the wrong thing on top. And on the bottom we have the h times this conjugate, x plus h minus 2 plus and root x minus 2. We're not going to worry about multiplying this out or distributing because remember the goal is to get rid of this h. So if we look along the top, we can see that we can now cancel the x's and we can cancel the 2's and so all that's left is the h and the h on the bottom will cancel with that h to generate a 1. So we'll end up getting that f prime is that limit as h approaches 0 of a 1 over that conjugate x plus h minus 2 plus a root x minus 2. Now if I compute the limit now that 0 is no longer an issue, we can see, let me get rid of this here, we can see that we'll end up with an f prime of x that is a 1 over a root x minus 2 plus another root x minus 2, which is this. So we have a derivative, and we can talk about the domain of that derivative. Notice that with domains, we have one of three problems, either division by 0, non-positives inside logs, or or excuse me, non-positives inside logs or negatives under even roots. So in this particular case, we have a division and we have an even root. So we've got to account for both of those. Looking at the root, we can see that the inside, that x minus 2, has to be greater than 0, which means x would be greater than or equal to 2. Now if we actually equal 2, then this is going to create a 0 on the denominator. So we don't even get the 2 included in the domain of f prime. Now our goal was to state the domain of f and the domain of f prime. So if we want the domain of f, 
which was that original square root of x minus 2. Well, on that domain, we need the inside of this to be greater than or equal to 0. So the domain of this one is x is greater than or equal to 2. So we can see that we lost the 2 in the domain of the derivative. Otherwise, they match up. So we need to think graphically about why that happened. If we look at our original function, which is an x minus 2 inside a root, that is the square root parent function that has been moved two units to the right. So it should look like this. Now, if we think about the derivative, the derivative is the slope of this picture. So the slope of this picture, if we were to change our color here and draw little tangent lines, we can see that the slope is always positive. It's getting increasingly more shallow as we move out to the right. But as we get closer and closer and closer to that point here at the bottom, we're approaching a vertical tangent line which has no slope. So it makes sense that the slope at 2 is going to be undefined because we will have a vertical tangent line which does not have a defined slope. Let's look at example 2 now, which says we want to find f prime if f is given to us. And again, we want to state the domain of f and the domain of f prime. So in this particular case, we can write f prime will be that limit as h approaches 0 of f of a plus h, or x plus h in this time case. So everywhere there is an x, I'm going to put an x plus h. Then I'm going to subtract the f of x, which is just this function. And then all of that gets divided by h. So here was our f of x plus h minus our f of x over h. To fix this, we're going to do what we've now done multiple times since section 2.7. We are going to create a common denominator for these two so that we can combine them. And then we're going to rewrite this division by h as a multiple of a 1 over h at the back. So if I get a common denominator for this first one, this particular fraction is going to need the 2 plus x that the other one has. So I'm going to make a smart choice for 1 to create that same denominator. Then I'm going to subtract this fraction, which needs the 2 plus x plus h. If I multiply this all out, remember what's guiding the entire process is I need to get rid of that h on the bottom. So on the bottom, I'm going to have the h, the 2 plus x plus h, and the 2 plus x. And on the top, I'm going to distribute. So I'll have a 2 plus an x minus a 2x minus an x squared minus a 2h minus an hx. Now I'm going to subtract all of this. So rather than trying to distribute the negative at the same time, I'm going to just put parentheses. So I have a 1 times a 2 plus an x plus an h, then minus a 2x minus an x squared minus an hx. If we've done this properly, then everything that doesn't have an h in it should disappear from the top. So the 2 cancels with the 2, x cancels with the x, 2x cancels with the 2x, the x squared cancels with the x squared, and we even get rid of our hx. So if we look at what's left now, on top we'll have a negative 2h minus another h. So I get a negative 3h over the h times the 2 plus x plus h times the 2 plus x. And I've not computed my limit yet, so I still need to write that limit out in front. Now the beauty of this is h will now cancel. And now I no longer have a problem with h equals 0. So I plug h equals 0 in, and I'll get a negative 3 over a 2 plus x quantity squared. Now if we look at the original function f, we can see that the domain of f, the only issue we run into is that division by 0. So the domain on f is x cannot equal negative 2. If we look at f prime, we notice that, again, the only issue is going to be that division. So that one will have the same domain. So in this particular case, we did not lose any domain elements when we took our derivative. If we think about the picture of the original one, we have an asymptote at negative 2. And we've got a 0 at 1 
and a horizontal asymptote of negative 1. No, excuse, yeah, negative 1. So our original picture is going to look something like this. And if we think about the slope, we can see here that no matter what I plug in on the bottom, the slope on the bottom will always be a ne positive number and on the top will always be negative. And if we look at the slope anywhere on this picture, they're always negative numbers. And the only place I won't have a slope is at this asymptote because I had a problem and there's not even a point there to graph to create a tangent line. So now I'd like you to do your notes web exam problem and then explain the relationship between the domain of the original function and the domain of the derivative. And to help guide that, I want you to think about which one has a larger domain and why.